Stanford University. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the penultimate uh, uh, fall quarter uh, uh, E380. Um, today we're going to depart a little bit from our normal uh, talking head format and try to run, uh, uh, run a, a, a conversational uh, session here. Um, some years ago, uh, this is Karen, De Karen Gedman from Pearson Education, and uh, uh, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with her for more years than I think I want to admit to. Uh, I've uh, followed her through uh, several companies as she went from Prentice Hall to uh, Addison Wesley and later to Pearson, uh, where she worked as an editor for uh, many of the technical books that you all own in your, uh, in your bookshelves, I suspect. Um, in any case, uh, she, uh, she and I were talking uh, uh, some years ago about a project that she was uh, uh, starting inside of uh, Pearson. Uh, the uh, uh, impact of that was eventually a project within Pearson, uh, which she uh, spearheaded and uh, founded. Part of the, uh, the deal was that she was going to come and talk to us about it when it actually was out and they had some real data. Uh, what uh, what uh, the project was, was to build a enterprise-wide uh, social network, for whatever that is, and uh, use that as a vehicle for uh, actually doing business. So um, you want to tell us a little bit about what you ended up doing? I mean, we, we talked about all sorts of uh, wonderful blue sky operations, you know, the, the dashboard for the universe and things <laughs> like that. We didn't quite get there, but uh, what, did, what did you do? Um, the, the problem we had within Pearson it was that it was difficult to find people unless you knew their name, um, in which case you probably wouldn't be looking too hard. And uh, we had people working in different companies, um, Addison Wesley, Prentice Hall, Penguin, Financial Times, but they really had no reason necessarily to talk to each other. So what we saw was that people were duplicating effort, doing similar things like building iPad apps or you know, doing something new with content, and nobody knew what each other was doing. And you couldn't find someone just based on either their expertise or their location. You could only find them if you knew their name. So I started talking to people like Dennis and to people out there and about what they were doing and decided that a business social collaboration tool would be the best thing, which there are those on the market. You can buy them off the shelf. But we, we chose one that was highly customizable and put it together. And we launched it at the end of this, this past February, February 2010. So. It was an, an interesting name. Neil. Neil. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of people submitted names, and they were <laughs> all bad. But uh, we picked Neil because um, it was we we did the tagline working as one one company as opposed to multiple companies because Pearson grew a lot by acquisition, so we wanted to start working more as one company as opposed oh, to sure. several. Okay. So, in any case, the question is, what is it? What is the social network? Really? Within within the organization, you've got uh, you have some data that you've uh, you found about how the uh, uh, how people are actually using it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided uh, different companies have done this differently, but we decided to let the users use the tool the way they wanted to. We only had a few basic guidelines: no politics, no religion, just because that gets too inflammatory. But we did let people form social groups. So within, within the social network, the way it works is you get to form groups, either open groups, members only groups, private groups, or whatever. So um, we found that not unlike when email first came in, when email first came in, you know, everyone used it to send jokes around. I mean, that's a long time ago. Most of you don't remember. But um, that's what they used it for until they understood what was, was really use why it was useful. Then, um, in this case, what we saw is people would form social groups. So, for example, Pearson Runners or a cooking group or whatever. Um, and we let, the, we let that happen. And that's how people familiarize themselves with the tool. And then they started forming business groups and using it for business. So what we found is um, for the people that are using it correctly and have figured it out, 
It's actually reducing some email traffic, which is great. I think p email has gotten way too pervasive now, and it's, so you, you become very reactive when you go into work in the morning and you just start answering things as opposed to working on projects. So instead, people are going into what our platform's called Neo, going into Neo and working in projects and groups, and everything's then in the group. You don't have these carbon copies and blind carbon copies and all the things we have in email. So. So, so, so what does is, what is the environment look like? You, you, is it like Facebook where you have, you know, your wall that <coughs> people post things on? And, and so well, you have a, it's, so parts of it are like LinkedIn because you have a profile, which you describe yourself and then people can find you by searching yeah. based on that, tagging yourself and things like that. Um, in terms of how it looks, there is a feed in the middle, which so you could say that resembles Facebook, I suppose. Um, there's a couple boxes on top that just, put out some featured content like something new in the world or whatever. Um, and, um, and then there's the groups and you can go in and go into your groups and do your work. So how many people have uh, Facebook accounts? Uh, maybe, maybe half. Twitter accounts? Um, far fewer, maybe a quarter. Uh, LinkedIn accounts? No, everybody has LinkedIn. That's because you can find people on it, sort of. And uh, how many people have uh, uh, some other kind of uh, communication mechanism with the outside world, like a blog or the like? Um, a few, three, four. Not many. Okay. Dennis, the Stanford question is, how many people are members of Club Nexus? Okay. How many? Well, that was it all here. How many people are members of Club Nexus? In what decade? <laughs> last decade. <laughs> In the last decade. Okay. okay. And then you're going to have to, this Eugene, Eugene, you're going to have to explain what Club Nexus is. Well, it's now called Orchid. Oh, Orchid. Yeah. Oh. Uh huh. You're Brazilian, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. How many people speak Portuguese? <laughs> Let me explain why you got small. Uh, well, small Orchid word. itself is Turkish, though. But its usage is <laughs> Brazil. Yes, we know that. I can okay. publish spam in Portuguese and Turkish. <laughs> you do? You must really be a honeypot. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I th I, I, speaking for myself, I have a Twitter account, a uh, Facebook account, and so forth. They're all incomplete. They all don't, uh, they, they all have very limited amounts of information on them. Because I'm unwilling to spend the amount of time it takes to uh, to make them uh, fully populated, so I'm I'm a I'm, I'm a bad citizen in that regard, I suppose. Do you have bad citizens? Yes, yes. I mean, we've only, we haven't been out that long. We have about 80 percent adoption rate, which is pretty good. Um, we're going after the last 20. Pearson's got 36,000 people, and um, we have no global HR system, so there's no way to keep everything. It's all different systems all over the place. Um, so we're kind of looking at this as people own their own profile, and they fill it out themselves. And you, you know, and and through that, we 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 can start to have more information about the employees in general. So, and what do you do to keep the information private, or don't you? Private from whom? From, uh, well, is everything exposed to everybody inside of Pearson? No, I mean the, your, your profiles are. Profile. You can you can go and look at somebody's profile, um, but you can form groups um, that are secret. So, for example, if you wanted to have a, a group where nobody could search the content, nobody knew could find it, you can do that. Then you can do private groups where you can know there's a group called that, but you can't see what's in it. And there's members only groups you can search the content but you can't contribute unless you're a member and then there's open groups which is anyone can see the content which you really want more open groups i mean obviously there's confidentiality things that you wouldn't want open but because that's the whole idea is that we're sharing right and that we're not we're not all doing the same thing in different businesses mm -hmm. so so we've had people like find you know post something about what they're working on and then somebody else comes and say, oh, I've, I've written code for that and, and give it to them and it's so it cuts down on our time on pro creating products. So things like that have happened. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, 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 uh, that's good. Exactly what you want. <laughs> have you had any uh, significant problems? Failures, uh, uh, breaches of etiquette, that sort of thing, or has it all been? Well, we, we did, uh, 
ha most of these communities seem to be very um, self-policing, so people don't want to look really bad in front of like their CEO or anyone else. We've had a couple cases, and so we what we did was we have a thing where you can flag it as inappropriate, and if two people flag it, then we take it down and take a look and see if it's if there's an issue or not. G generally, though, very very few, very very few. Considering how big the community is, it's pretty amazing. But again, I think people. When somebody starts to do something they shouldn't, people will come at them before I would even necessarily notice, right? And why is this better than email? Um, this is the Luddite community over here. <laughs> um, why do I think it's better than email? Well, I think when you're doing email, you are just, I think of email as one-to-one -one or one-to-two communication. But if you're going to be in a group talking more than that, you don't, you, this idea of doing an email with 17 CCs is maddening for one thing because everyone's got too much email already. And why do that when you can have it in a group of 17 people? You can all see the content. You can all see who authored it. You can all see who's contributing to it. So it's all there. So I think that's better than all this vast amount of email that's going back and forth and people are drowning in. So that's my, that's just my opinion. Right. Seems to be working so far. Is arguing permissible? <laughs> yes, of course. It's encouraged. Yeah. This um, is with Diffie over here. Huh. So uh, I'm a Luddite, and I just acknowledge this. I mean, as, you know, I'm not sure I'm opposed to these things, and I just haven't gotten around to learning to use any of them. <laughs> but the point is, how is what you're suggesting, two, it has seemed to me to have two aspects. One, um, you know, typically people, if there are 17 people, you have an alias. And, you know, it's called, you know, the 17. Uh, and you just send a message to the 17 and everybody gets it. Two, if you're doing it on from one service like Gmail, it will do all the you know all of the data compression. Effectively, you just have a site there where you can go in and find what's on the alias of the 17. And it has the additional advantage that at some overhead, uh, people don't all have to be members of the same system. You have this very loose public standard about how email works and so you can, as I say, there'll be some overhead now of extra copies of things, but people uh, don't have to all to be served by the same uh, family of servers. Um, let's see, how would I answer that exactly? I think that's we. That's what we were doing. Is we were just doing email, and what was getting lost was any kind of transparency, so that people were duplicating effort all over the organization. When you think about 36,000 people in 70 countries, there's no one way for um, them to see what each other is doing. And this, what we're trying to do, is have greater transparency around some of the work. Email has has two things you don't offer, as a matter of fact. I mean, if you have a closed group of 17, it's fine. It doesn't have outright open groups. That is, you can't go, you know, there isn't a status in email that says, let this be discoverable to anybody who happens to want to see it. And there isn't a read-only form of the, you have to belong to post, but everybody can see it. So maybe that's what the difference is. That's just a more complex mail um, it's all email. group manager. Yeah. Um, but the, the big thing is that the on the um, client side, it's the organization, but it's not clear that that's just a, a, a no, yet another indictment of every mail reader is bad because mm -hmm. um, you know people make a lot of money s selling inbound mail classifiers and you're essentially doing inbound mail classification because you're sending a message to a group and it's appearing in the right place so they have a screen of things that they're participating in and when they are playing in group 17 and they say, tell us to the other people in group 17, it goes to the group 17 thing, but that's just inbound mail classification in some sense. Mm -hmm. how, is this, how is this not a really good mail group manager with a good mail reader? Well, I mean, First good mail reader. Right. By the way, it's a big product. You make <laughs> lots of money. There's way more money in this than publishing. <laughs> well, almost anything you can make more money than publishing, right? Well, we'll, um, we'll get to the publishing issue later. <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, all I can, t all I can t talk to you about is the experience we've had. And so one, one of the things that we've noticed that people are doing is using it also as um, a place to keep things. One of the things that happens is, let's say somebody quits, right? They, they wipe the computer, psh, you know, whatever content or whatever they produced in their career at Pearson generally w is pretty much gone unless they'd sent it to somebody or... So having a place to keep documents where it's always discoverable is, has been a huge, a uh, huge thing to our organization. People would, um, be, if they wanted to send a document to 17 people, um, it would crash people's mailboxes if it was of any size whatsoever. Because in a corporation, you know, they kind of limit how much email you can get. And I know that's not the case as much with Gmail, obviously. But for, you know, if you're using Microsoft Outlook, it was a huge problem. I mean, uh, you're in email jail all the time. You can't get out until you you know, delete everything. So, um, so that's another way that we've used it. Um, we, um, go ahead. Well, another thing that strikes me, in industry, if someone is terminated, uh, you need to be able to remove their access quickly. And with mm -hmm. email, that's much harder to uh, ensure. It's trivial if you own your server. Yeah. <laughs> It seems to me that with social networking, one of the things you, s you mentioned, contribute. An organization can see who contributes, which you can't do in email, right? Can you say something about um, the other side of making people liked or favored or, um, you know, sometimes in a classroom, for example, the most talkative person isn't the most brilliant. And maybe the most liked isn't necessarily the best contributor, but they might be measured by a social networking system and get promoted because of it. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, I think it, one thing, um, you know, the cur in the world today, you know, everyone keeps talking about flattening organizations, you know, the organizational structures flattening so that there's more matrix management, all these things. I see these tools as really helpful in that way because you can see <coughs> when somebody's doing a really valuable, um, con whatever the contribution might be. So. For example, I was talking to a company recently who has a tool like this in theirs, and they do internships with college students. And the uh, college students, only about about a quarter of them get jobs afterwards. And it's a, it's a big multinational company. They brought in their interns, and um, one of the interns really got how to use something like this and was very active and contributed a lot of really excellent things. And at the end, she had like 14 job offers from many different countries. So I think um, the visibility of somebody in a different part of the organization, it does, it's, I think it's a really, I think it's great because it, it, talent can be overlooked so easily if, um, if they're just sort of drowned in the 36,000 people. Some of this function sounds like what people are doing with wikis inside of corporations now. I've used those in companies that have been serve some of the purposes you have. Mm -hmm. It didn't serve the discovery purpose, and we had mailing lists and other things for um, communication with groups and internally to groups. Um, so, you, you, But you said your main focus was on just removing duplication of effort and trying Well, that was one of the, that one was of the one main, of them. Main, mm -hmm. main thing. How would you compare that to a wiki system? Have you used something like that to? Um, I have. I'm personally not extremely technical person. I have used wikis um, before. I found them a little bit clunky compared to this. This is a very um, <laughs> user interface friendly kind of tool. It's very easy to use. Um, um, people post blogs in here as well, so there's a lot of ways for people to communicate through them. So I mean, it, it, I get what you're saying. There is some similarity, but um, it's just a little bit more, I, in my mind, user friendly, and it does have a little bit more functionality. So. Does it include uh, video and uh, sound? People upload videos all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of, you can have your own personal YouTube uh, uh, session. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, some uh, young guy from Korea the other day um, uploaded a video to the CEO. And it was, it was quite charming, actually. <laughs> Very talented. So, so a little while ago, you didn't uh, have enough room in the mail system. Now here we are uploading <laughs> 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 That's the Luddite speaking. <laughs> well, there's another problem. Well, it's, ho it's hosted differently, right? I mean, this is hosted. Uh, this is hosted in the cloud, and um, there's just. So all you're saying is is that you're comparing a, a brain damaged mail system with with a new toy. And perhaps. Yeah, new toys win. Perhaps. Yeah. Well, th th no, there's, there's a problem in that. Um, 
we've spent inside my agency two different social networking systems for taxpayers. I, I should say, on the taxpayers' dollar. And it turns out, actually, the system we absolutely have to use is an awful system called Windchill, which you've probably never heard of. And, and the reason why we have to use Windchill is it turns out it's not video. What we really need is we need engineering drawings. And the formats of some of those just are not well compatible with uh, social networks at this point in time. I was wondering uh, if uh, if there's a way, or if you figured out a way to actually measure, uh, you know, it, it, it cannot be this cannot be a complete replacement for some other tool, of course. But if there's any any measure that you came up with, some sort of analytics or some sort of uh, measure to uh, to to say something about how improvement in communications or performance or other things in general, some some statistics or something like that. Right. Yeah. We have uh, we get a dump of everything that's been done, and we use business objects to, d and we've developed an analytics dashboard. I mean, we are still pretty new in, but um, we we are starting to see some of the um, some of the things that we had hoped for. So. Another, another thing we use this tool for is when I started this, one of the things that drove me mad was that there was a proliferation of intranets in the company, right? And I could never remember, you know, the URL of the one that I was looking for. It drove me absolutely crazy. So we're collapsing the intranets into the tools so that they can have a space within the tool and then you can put it. So there'd be more like one place to go instead of 157 places. So. Um, one of, one of the analytics is what money are we saving because we're doing that. Um, in terms of the communication, a lot of, some of the things are anecdotal. You know, I find out someone found out, found some code or I found out someone, uh, met someone who helped them make a product that, you know, started to make money. Um, so some of it's anecdotal, but we are, we have built out an analytics dashboard so that we can start measuring things more closely. But yeah, I think that's really important to, uh, to do that. The, um, uh, the improvements you, the improvements that we're seeing so far um, right now it's more right now I see more people finding each other so um, and they're, they'll, they'll uh, let me just try to use a concrete example I saw the other day there was a sort of uh, um, a few months ago there was sort of uh, somebody posted something about QR codes I don't even know what QR I was like whatever I don't know whatever <laughs> you know um, and um, it just took off, you know, blah, 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 everyone's talking about QR codes all of a sudden. And then the next thing I know, we've got QR codes on everything. We've got QR codes on novels and Penguin. We've got QR <laughs> codes on, on uh, yeah, I know, I know. But I mean, it is a way, water cooler conversations that used to happen, you know, people talking to each other in the cafeteria or around the water cooler, wherever. This, this kind of opens it up so that more people can hear when something like that happens. And before, if somebody was talking about something in, in Penguin, you know, whatever it was, whatever, if maybe they're talking about social networking outside, what, how, you know, how do you do it? Nobody else over in Financial Times or over in Pearson Education, no, no, nobody else would have heard about it. So it's, it just opens up. And the w because the world is changing so much faster, it just seems more important that people can see that. So, so how, have you compared your system with commercial products like it is Microsoft. a commercial product. Oh, okay, like Microsoft SharePoint or right. whatever. So uh, we are using a, a company product called Jive, Jive Software. Okay. And um, we chose them, you know, based on um, the fact that they were further down the road on this because this is what they started out doing. Uh -huh. Now, now Microsoft SharePoint has a big social component, but but because Jive was further down the road, we chose them. Okay. Yeah. And they were really customizable. They were really, really, so we could make it beautiful. After you got it beautiful, you got all the 80% adoption rate, that all sounds really nice. How do you index or search this content that's being generated on a daily basis and stay current and find things? How right. does the process work? Um, well, th there, there's there's a search engine within it, and we uh, we we try to educate people about tagging their content. I mean, I think that's pretty natural for people that are used to social networks, but people that aren't, um, you have to teach them what tagging is, what it means, and um, and uh, it works it works pretty well. Yeah, so it's, it's a good search engine. Uh, it's it's an o it's the main search engine that people use. Uh, not not I mean um, open source that. Uh, oh well, it'll increase. 
Mm, I can't think of the name yeah. of it. Sorry. It's the Adobe. It's the Adobe. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. Not Adobe. Yeah. Not Adobe. Apache. Um, Apache right. <laughs> yeah. It's Lucrece, I think. Yeah. What do you do about security? Um, so we have uh, encrypted between our data center and the server where it's it's hosted. We have that encrypted, um, and um, and then. Let's see now, how do I describe this? This is where I'm not technical, and so I count on my technical guy to help me out. So, um, so we have the encrypted con uh, where it's hosted, and then through that connection, we do user provisioning, deprovisioning, and LDAP authentication. Um, so I can access it from anywhere. And then there's additional integration points for like SharePoint and Confluence if we wanted to search those uh, instances as well. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Okay. But the bits are sitting out there someplace, and they're unencrypted out there. So you are trusting the... <coughs> trusting yeah. I, I think they are encrypted. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm guessing that they are encrypted. And in fact, what, uh, uh, what you do have is you have a uh, uh, authenticated encrypted link uh, that uh, allows you to bring information uh, to and from your site from the cloud. I think the question is whether... Go ahead. It's awful hard to do searches on, on encrypted stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, the searching is done in, in, in the cloud. Right. right. Well, that's it's in the so cloud. what I'm trying to say is... That's in the clear in the cloud. cloud encrypted, then it's hard to search them. And mm -hmm. if not, then you're trusting the, the guy who runs the cloud. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. No question. Well, is it is it uh, dedicated? Is it in the cloud in the sense like Amazon's, or, so it's shared with other people, and you're relying on their internal security, or is it a hosted a, a, a sort more more like a hosted service where they just happen to have multiple tenants in the same data center? It's um, it's a single tenant model. So they own their servers. So it's just, it's just they're just not under your roof. In right. The, that's that's how it's cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Carl, you you had a question. <laughs> no, I'm just clarifying that that it really is it, it really is in the clear in in, in the cloud, right? So, um, so what are the problems? I mean, every system has problems. What would you like to see that's not there, or what is working differently than you like? Thought it would. Um, I think um, it's a lot. What needs to be done still, I think, is education because people do put up content and don't tag it, or um, people um, they they uh, they kind of start to get into it and then they they're not really sure how to keep using it. And, and we we're, we're getting more and more. I mean, every month it goes up. I mean, more and more people are actively using it. But I still think there's education and training that needs to be done. I wish it was a little bit easier. But in publishing, I mean, the business itself is in such transformation because uh, everything's changed um, that uh, some of the people that work in publishing aren't necessarily the most technically savvy people. Um, so it's, it, they're not used to this sort of way of working. So I think. Education is the number one thing that I think about and worry about and try to teach people how to use it. So even though it's not that hard to use, but it still still needs some people just need more help. Well, uh, we were talking earlier about the issue of multitasking here. Because this, this increases the information, access, the information that can be accessed by each individual. Do people take advantage of it? Or do they feel overwhelmed by this huge mass of information that somehow they're supposed to be? Able I'm sure there are people who feel. I'm, I'm sure there are people who feel overwhelmed. I, I think that's just. Um, but most, the, a lot of people have just found it, you know, invaluable because there's, sh there, you know, there's communities of practice that are forming, um, experts coming together that never even knew each other existed. I mean, it used to be, you know, I could, I could go to a conference for Pearson. I, was, I actually I was just talking to this guy one not too long ago. He was at some analytics kind of programmer or something like that. He went to some conference and they did this whole thing where, okay, everyone from Microsoft stand up, everyone. Uh, well, they get to Pearson, six guys stand up, six different parts of the company don't even know each other. That's a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. When they could be, and they're all like doing the same thing. So this way these communities of practice are really coming together and that's a really good thing. 
So. Do people make uh, uh, spend a lot of time uh, making pretty uh, profiles and uh, fancy? You know, the Facebook or not the fa Facebook, the, the MySpace model. They um, they just upload a photo of themselves and then it's it's text based. You know, some people are much more clever about it, but you know that's the way of the world. But it's it's text, so it's not much they can do. Marriages and divorces and uh, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, you get somebody to put something like that, and you're like, why did you put that on there? But you know, to those people. I think the cream rises when and the other stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, um, how much has the email volume changed since you? We haven't we haven't done that analytics yet. We 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 were going to wait until we had everyone in, and we have a, at least a year behind us. Email well, server. There's periodic outages. How long does it take people to screen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <In> time. <laughs> yeah. uh, I I just don't have that information right now. I did see a Forrester study that said on average, after a year of having this tool, you re reduce email by 26 percent. I I just saw that recently. But. One of the things I've observed when large organizations that industry's going through some chaos like Big Pharma or something, they get the most leverage out of sites where they can easily share things. And by that I mean like, say you search the corpus of all the knowledge base out there and you come up with a really interesting search and you can share that with other people that you know that might find that interesting some mechanism like that or some form of that really can generate organic growth internally and even add more value to the system is something similar encouraged where you are or there are tools that allow sharing and make it we, we use something called permalink which is just i find a search that i like <coughs> it's saved i can share that with anybody and then they can share it with other people and pass it along and so it almost has like a chain reaction effect in terms of utilization so you're saving a search? I, I yeah, guess so I, I need to understand that a so little bit. So maybe okay. I go into your system, mm -hmm. and I'm looking for a particular thing. So in pharma, I want to look up uh, something about some new mechanism or some new drug or some new research. And I find a couple of key terms that people have tagged in a certain way, and all of a sudden it like is, generates a great result, right. better than I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So we find that adoption can be driven by being able to save that as a permalink, which is just like an address for this particular search to be stored somewhere. Ah. And then share that among people <coughs> I know. And then before you know it, you have the transplant team from some other country call and you say, hey, what about this? And it kind of really encourages that mixing in a way that you couldn't have done with email or even wiki or whatever, because it's taking the action of searching and the way you think about that problem and publishing that content throughout the enterprise some way. And it's in a very social way. It's, I send it to some friend of mine, they send it to some friend of theirs. And, um, and so you couldn't really do that any other way. And we see that as one of the key advantages to using these kind of things. This that's is sort great. of the angry birds model. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> similar. Yeah, right. that's which, which, actually, which actually is, just, is a question which we should, should put on the record. We, we, we talked about this earlier. Apps, you have them. Um, the next version of the software, which just came out, which we're going to upgrade to, is apps-based. And the idea then is that you can, um, um, let's say there's something in the enterprise that you do all the time, you sign <coughs> expense reports or you do this, you do that, you can have an app for that so that you can easily kind of get to it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then you can also use the apps to design your own home page and things so that you don't have to have the same look or, as others. And the uh, but the other question is then, is there an app store? Uh, Apple's trademark not uh, not being infringed. But yeah, uh, yeah, there will be. I mean, uh, Jive is going to have their own app store, which they'll put, they allow other companies that are using their software to put up their apps, so if they want to use them. So like I could do, I mean, our company could do a Financial Times app, which we have one. I guess we could put it in the Jive store. And so if another company wanted to get it, they could, as opposed to going through, yeah. How does your system integrate with Outlook? And is that an issue? Does most people have two windows up, your system and Outlook? Yeah, I think that's what most people do. But interestingly, some Microsoft guys just started, uh, just came up with a tool so that 
that integrates them so that, um, and we have not bought it yet. I, I'm thinking about it. It's not expensive or anything, but I, I just saw it the other day. I just saw a demo. So you get email, and I get email from you, and I hover over you, and your profile comes up over here from, from, from Neo. And, um, and you can move discussions out of email into mm -hmm. um, Neo. And, and uh, so, yeah, it, these guys came up with a great looking product. I just saw it the other day. So. What's it called? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> Jive, it's, but Jive, Jive has it, okay. and so I can just get oh, it. Oh, I that. see. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I've got the auto hover on uh, auto profile on on hover, and that was one of the fastest things I've turned off in a long time. No, really. Like, God, I didn't want to. <laughs> but um, one of the in the past version of corporate America, team building was a big thing. I knew, but you start off at the beginning by talking about inappropriate uses. Team building, by definition, is consists of inappropriate activities with your with your with your coworkers in an effort to build, I don't know, rapport or whatever the HBR word is for it. Um, do people do is is the person in charge of team building seeing this as Neo as, yay, you're doing stuff on my budget, or is, are they saying no, we still need to have Christmas parties or whatever it is they're using this year for team building? Yeah, I haven't had anybody complain about it or anyone bring that up to me at all. So. I think there's still going to be Christmas parties. I mean, I think one thing, one use I've seen of it is the idea that you might reduce time and meetings in terms of when you, so the guy who's the head of Asia Pac for us, he has 17 countries, and when he has his senior leadership meetings, they all come together, and the first day I've been to one of these meetings is pretty much what I call death by PowerPoint, right? Everyone talks about what their region's <laughs> doing, what their sales are, da 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 and then, then, the, then the real meeting, in my mind, the real thing, starts the next day, right, where you actually start to work on problems. So what he's used Neo for is he made a senior leadership team um, each take a video of themselves describing what their, um, what's going on in their region and saying what their biggest business problem is. And he eliminated that first day and, and made everyone watch this, told everyone you watch the videos ahead of time and you come prepared. And um, that seems to have been very effective. And so it seemed a lot better to me than death by PowerPoint. So that's another kind of usage that I've seen. Does everyone have access to video? Well, I think you can use your phone. <laughs> OK. Smartphones are smart. It's all right, yeah. Anybody else here? Go ahead, Cal. So someone mentioned Wiki. It seems to me that one of the really nice things about a Wiki on the side of something like this is after you figure something out, you get a place to put the summary. If you if you come in on the tail of an email discussion, you know you have to wait around and, and it's hard to find the stuff that you're after. Right. If you sort of summarize it and put it in the wiki, then it's then you have sort of one place to keep everything up to date. Right. I think though that's a cultural thing. It, that's a in the, in the early history of mailing lists, for instance, there was a there was an etiquette of Please tell me this answer, and I will summarize. And it, it's similar to the NPR thing of, I'll, and I'll take my answer offline. And what all people <laughs> did was they just simply, they just simply appended all their emails that they received. That didn't give you a quality answer, as an example. The problem with wikis, um, and, and not just merely Wikipedia, is that you're very dependent upon the expertise of a of a crowd, and of all people. Um, Fred Terman, who founded the engineering school here, my favorite quote of Fred Terman's is, no number of six-foot high jumpers will, equal, will ever equal a seven-foot high jumper. And uh, Howard Rangel is, in fact, I think he's giving a talk later this evening on, on crowdsourcing and the like. There are some bad Wikipedia pages out there. <laughs> and, and it could be in any cases. Actually, one of the worst, for that Hal would appreciate, one of the worst Wikipedia pages I've seen is Mount Everest. Uh, it's because it, it's not maintained by climbers, as an example. I, that's that's a part of it. In fact, the best Wikipedia page of Mount Everest is the German Wikipedia page. But um, it's what's interesting about it is that it's not just engender, engendering Wikipedia and the like. There's now actually counters to Wikipedia out there that people are sort of poo-pooing to a certain degree 
there's a conservapedia and there's Christianpedia as well too. And of course, the Christianpedia, uh, the world is no longer is no, is no lo older than six thousand years approximately as we know. So um, that's, that's great. It gives them a place to put that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's all searchable too by Google as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I worked for a play company where the the culture was that you know if, if you went to somebody and, and asked them a question and, and it got a complicated answer that you you were sort of duty bound to go put it in a wiki page. Okay. Um. What's the most surprising thing that you have, that somebody has put together to, to use the system that you've seen? Actually, that video I saw the other day of the Korean kid talking to the CEO was the most surprising thing I had seen because I thought it was kind of, um, I don't know, it was kind of a, it was sort of a ballsy thing to do, you know, just to so put it out there and say. You fly to Korea and slap the kid? I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, because it's actually, um, what he said was, he, he asked her a couple of questions. And then he said, uh, he took his phone and he said, no pressure, but I'm turning on my stop, stopwatch just to see how long it takes you to write back to me. And they were, they were legitimate kind of businessy questions, but not, you know, not overly personal or anything. And um, um, thousands of people literally, <laughs> you know, were like, because it was very inventive and funny. It's hard for me to describe it, but it was very inventive and funny. Thousands of people were writing, oh, I love this, da, 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 da. So she ended up replying, the CEO, because there was so many people <laughs> looking at it, I'm sure. I mean, I think she liked it, too, but it was just, it was just really, so I thought that was very surprising. So. That, that's, that's really pretty, pretty nice. But you should, you should explain how this all came about and who was, in fact, the instigator of getting a social network in place. It was our CEO. I don't know that she knew it was going to be a social network, but her, her thing was whenever she was going around talking to people, people would say things like, I didn't know that was happening. I didn't know they were doing that um, about other parts of the company. And th she was sort of the only person who seemed to, you know, be able to. And so people would constantly say, I can never find anybody. I can da da da. And so she, it was her idea. She didn't know what it would look like technically or what it, what it meant, but she knew that, that we had a problem. So, do you find a cultural difference between people, how people use it, uh, to uh, people who grew up with the existence of Facebook and the like, uh, look at things very differently than uh, uh, the Luddites that uh, <coughs> <coughs> think that email is a new in innovation? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, d I do think the kids take to it quicker. Um, it's not always age-based, but I think there is some of that. There is some of that. Um, they take to it quicker. They really get what it's used for. They don't fuss around with it. They really use it. Um, so I think there is somewhat of an age difference, yeah. And what about the work product? I mean, do, do, does work product now actually get produced in the context of the, uh, the social network, or is, there, is that off on the side? And, the conversations that are maintained in the network only uh, uh, about the work product. Um, so about the kind of products we're creating. Yeah. Um, a lot of work is being done within there to that seems to be helping create products more quickly because the conversations tend to be a little bit wider ranging and more people can be involved. Um, I think that's coming. I, I think, I can't say today, oh, yeah, we've created 17 products out of this thing. Uh, but I can say that I see a change. And, and, and the other thing I've noticed is the pace of change is, is, is faster. You know, uh, we're not the most fast changing industry in the world. And, and <laughs> we are starting to get faster because the people are coming together to talk. I, like, or, or innovation, you know, the other, the other thing is we have like we have a few innovation groups that have formed people have formed them for whatever reason and people you know can vote things up and then um, I, I expect we're we've, we've got a couple ideas that have come up that way that are you know being off looked at to be made into products mm -hmm. so no no uh, no startup spin outs and that's not yet no no not yet <laughs> no, no entrepreneur in. Okay. what about what about uh, the financial times I mean you have a component that's actually uh, gathers information across the world, builds tables of statistics, uh, uh, writes articles, publishes them in newspapers that are read worldwide, um, has various editions across the world. 
Uh, is this used as the base for uh, actually constructing the newspaper yet? Do you think it will be? I don't think I don't think it's being used as a base to produce the newspaper, but I do think now the Financial Times has a, a greater uh, amount of people that they can talk to within the organization. I mean, they're a relatively small organization, two, three thousand people, um, and so the fact that they now have a bit of a window into s other parts of Pearson, I think, is good for the Financial Times, and it's good for the rest of Pearson to have them, you know, being more visible. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, makes a great deal of sense. Uh, and some of the other publications have uh, reader comments, et cetera, et cetera. Any, can you, is there any way or that this might get opened up so that your subscribers might uh, be part of your audience? Yeah. Um, right now, it's an internal tool, and we've got it. We've got it there because we want it to be just internal because that's we, that was the use case it was solved for. However, I've had a lot of people come to me and ask me that. Can I use this with my customers, whether their customers are teachers, whether it's authors, whether it's, um, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. And so um, we are going to we are going to do a, a small external instance with the idea that people can just use it for things like that. We're not going to we're not going to use it to um, we're not going to have a shopping cart or anything like that just to exchange information with other people, because one of the things people will do now is if they're, if they're talking to their customer advisory board, let's just say, it's a bunch of teachers or professors around the country. Um, so they want to post some things out to them. So what are they going to do? They're going to do it from Pearson. Or if it's a really big document, oh, geez, forget my mailbox isn't going to be able to handle that. So they, well, they go get a Hotmail account and send it out, which isn't very secure. So we would like to have this external instance for things like that. What happens in five or 10 years? What's the lifetime of this social network? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer. I think I see it as becoming sort of the single sign-on portal for Pearson, so that um, that's what you sign into when you come in in the morning, and then all your things are there, whatever those things are, uh, apps or whatever. And uh, I think that's where it's going to go, single sign-on. Do you think people use, will use it as a management tool as well? As, I mean, right now it's a communications tool. It's not a workflow tool or a uh, work management tool? Well, um, people, people do some workflow things in there, like, you know, edit documents and things, but I think if it's a heavy kind of workflow, it isn't, it's not really as good for that as something like, you know, SharePoint or something like that. But um, people are using it to manage their teams and things like that. We, we're gonna, we have, you know, you can have instant messaging in it, and so people are using it like that. Again, people are really interested in the idea of cutting back on email because they feel like their day is sucked away um, just by answering email when they're not getting enough work, regular work done on their projects. Does it have a whiteboard facility and a way to conduct remote meetings? No, not, not now. Not right now. I wouldn't be surprised if that's coming. Because uh, work in email feel like you didn't get, it, get anything done, whereas if you do it on the social networking. <laughs> I think people tell me because it, it feels reactive. They come and they start reacting as opposed to being proactive. So if you sign, so if I sign on in the morning and I go straight to my group that I, where I'm working on creating a certain new product or whatever, I'm going and doing that rather than, and I see what's been posted overnight by different people around. That's reading email. But it's reading email. You're not reading the email about all the other things. It's auto classified. You're not the classifier. classifier yeah. Okay. Here's the difference. Yeah. If email was classified, or if people had decent administrative assistants, <laughs> then it would be exactly the same. It's it's an auto administrative assistant that says she's not doing that today. So all that stuff goes out over on the site. But the reason people jumped on email was they liked the interruption. And then you said you had an instant messenger, which means that the next thing that's going to happen is that a prediction that people are going to say, oh, you really need to know about this, and they start sending instant messages, which are just as, which are more interruptive than email. Yeah, because people expect to hear back from you right away. Well, no, it's because it's poor form to turn off your instant message. I right. get yelled at for not, I didn't have one for six months, and this is a big problem. Uh, because I turn off the email, and that's okay, but I didn't have this instant messenger. That's just wrong. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's evil. We'll need a set of Twitter messages. likes 
feeds at the top <laughs> of the screen so you can see four or five groups that you met belong to, so all, all of their Twitter feeds in front of you, <laughs> so that the, inter the messaging can be interrupted uh, <laughs> and so forth. That's all like news when emails started to explode. First he gave it to his secretary <laughs> and then he even stopped. The final answer was he stopped reading email, period. <laughs> anyway, there's a whole story behind it. I'm just summarizing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's true. The question is, uh, at that point, email was the social network, and that sort of says that you're opting out of the social network. Um, that's the knock on your store, you That's the social network. <laughs> in, in direct communication is, uh, is advantageous, perhaps. So will we have a, you think we'll have social networks of the sort that we have today in five years? Pardon? There's all kind of dynamics going on. It's a little hard to predict which is which. Well, there's certainly. I'm not finding controllability in any. What I want to control, I can't, and vice versa. Um, there's certainly people studying it. A, a, a woman from England uh, who's coming here to talk to the Institute of the Future just emailed me. She, she spent a year here on the behest of the English government to understand. Uh, how the English language is changing, like, and she's mm. following social networks, and like, there's lots of these social scientists who are trying to figure out ways of how to use social networks and the like. Yeah, that's an interesting. My favorite Twitter people learn to abbreviate things, but yeah. in horrible, often in horrible ways, not in funny ways. Well, as I was just telling Andy here, uh, you know, she came because why did the term web surfing come up? And she was certain it was California culture. So she got the year in Santa Barbara, you may know this place, and you know, also came up to the Bay Area as well, too. <laughs> it's a long story, but I mean, there's people getting lots of money to study these phenomena, if you will. <laughs> well, five years from now, sure. Did she visit Hawaii? <laughs> no. No? No. no. <laughs> well, she, she, she's... she's of the of the non-invented yeah. school then because I, I know Norm surfs, you know, Ab Abramson. Yeah. Yes, I mean that whole story, yeah. and, and like no, she she went she decided on Santa Barbara. That was I see. okay. I only caught her in her last month of the of the twelve months she was in the United States at that time. But she comes back here and she's willing to talk. By the way, to any old farts like Hal or Dennis and, and the like. I mean, this is what they pay her for. You know, there's been some talk about kind of interruptions and the hassle factor with new technology, but one of the things I've seen in developing analogous systems in other industries is that you could create something like a query for something that hasn't happened yet. So you can imagine you have all this content feeding in that people are working in, and you say, I want to have a query about open textbook uh, licensing that involves some kind of small payment for printed copies or, or whatever the strange thing is and nobody's tagged that yet. But if you set this kind of query out there, when someone starts contributing that content, you could get an alert. So what this means is you could have hyper-targeted content directed to you or identified that you really care about and you don't have to classify anything, you don't have to filter anything, you just come up with the terminology or the metadata that you want to be alerted about. Google and that really hasn't happened before. Google, you know, Google does that. Google Alerts already does that. Not they have really. Numerous uh, alerts. Yeah, but th I'm talking about um, it. There's a disambiguation thing that happens that you can deal with the metadata that's user created much more granularly than you can with Google. And you're talking about Google Alerts, I guess. Is that mm -hmm. what you're talking about? And so that's more of an open thing. But I'm saying when you have a closed community and a controlled vocabulary and insight into metadata, you can create something that somebody hasn't discovered yet or somebody hasn't talked about and say, I want to know when this happens. And then there's some guy in Shanghai and there's somebody in Canada that comes up with this at the same time and now you know about it too. And that's kind of the germ of a little community around some new innovation or some new discovery or some new product. So there, there has been some research work in terms of building uh, data mining tools that look for relationships of, a, of certain sorts and the relationships are 
uh, discovered out of whole cloth. And you could, in fact, run that against your transaction database in, in a system like this and uh, build queries that fit some fit patterns that are discernible within the, uh, uh, within the data and then try to uh, associate those with particular concepts and presumably do a lot of triage and find a few that might be of interest and follow through on that. Uh, is that the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, so in fact, if, if, you, if you're in a domain like pharma or publishing mm -hmm. or whatever it is, it, you can get pretty granular and you don't have to do a lot of triaging because you know mm -hmm. the, the terminology is pretty standard or the things people are contributing. So in your case, I would look at all the tags people are generating and what are they talking about and what are they not talking about that I'm interested in. And then like the Ronco, set it and forget it, you know, set your query. When this conversation comes up, I'm going to be aware of it. Sort of a Warfian hypothesis for tagging. Yeah. You can't you can't tag until you know what you want to tag. And well, a lot of times people want to see things and then say, "I'm interested in that." Okay. So you see the metadata with the, what people are already looking for. Mm -hmm. Martin, you had some, uh, some information theoretic to based tools that to basically say tax prediction, whatever. One of my students and you should do it with human performance. So you can imagine, at least then we imagine all kind of tools using this kind of uh, statistical modeling that can help you predict or look for correlations or however you can formulate it. We do that in control of some of the science and engineering all the time with non-human data. Once human data becomes so predictable as text, like 1.1 1 .1 bit per symbol, then uh, you can do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. At least we imagined all kinds of things. We didn't really do it. But what was the name of it? Who, who was the student? Uh, Mike Roberts, Mike Roberts. His thesis. Well, do we think that, that uh, we're all going to go home and work on our Facebook page? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or your Neo not. page? <laughs> well, yeah. Everything but. but yeah. He wants the con converse, basically. He wants to know everything he wouldn't put on it, roughly speaking. Uh, Perhaps. <laughs> so can you characterize that? Yeah. Any other comments here? Oh. Yeah. OK, well, you know, go ahead, please. Uh, what I find is that when you have a, an enterprise-based social network, the conversation or the discourse is very different. and. You know, something like Facebook is your cocktail party face, you know, the kind of things you want to talk about. Here I am vacationing in Maui or whatever great display behavior I want to exhibit to the world. But in enterprise, it's much more focused on what am I going to contribute that's actually useful um, and on topic. You know, it's not as, it's not as wide ranging. So a lot of times the quality can be better just because it's released by you as you write it and by the comments and the other things they talked about. There's a much stronger uh, variance is reduced in mm -hmm. the type of things people contribute. Yeah, I would agree. I think people think twice before they... Yeah, but you can set up stuff off to the side for things like, you know, the local softball league or something. You can. Yeah, we, we do have, like I said, social groups that happen. And, and, and I do see that people use them first, and then, then they move on. That's sort of how they get comfortable with the tool. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you use the cultural differences. I was just the other def meaning of that question, which is you're in, what, 68 countries, you said. Uh, do you see a difference in usage in North America and Europe versus, say, Asia, where cultures are more concerned about their, their status and you know, saving face, so to speak? Um, do you see a difference in usage culturally in that way? You know, um, people can post it in their own language, and so, you know, a lot of that so I can't really yeah. <laughs> read. Um, <coughs> but we're seeing, I mean, Asia is using it a lot. I, South America is using it a lot less. We're trying to figure out, you know, why. We don't really know. I, um, 
you know, some, some countries have just been more conservative about using it because maybe they didn't really understand it. So we, I find that if I send someone down or I go down and I chat about it and talk about it and talk about why it's helping other parts of the company, then we'll see the usage go up. But um, I haven't seen that. But again, we're at, a, we're at a place where there's, you know, thousands and thousands of posts a day. It's not like I'm reading them all. So. Mm -hmm. well, you know, that, that, that's an interesting point. I, I think you said at one point that you, uh, you have about 2,000 languages that you deal with. Is that right? No, I can't think it was that many. Well, <laughs> it's many. It's many. It's a lot. Uh, but <laughs> you, you don't have a translation tool? I mean... I've had people ask me about that, and um, we don't. I, I ha we've looked into it. There are people who make things like that available, but most people are just using Google Translate if they're really interested in something that's going on that they don't, they can't read. Yeah, see, it seems to me that, that, that it's really important that you have uh, a translation tool that's hidden in the product. That you you say that I'm yeah, an English yeah. speaker and I don't speak French, and somebody sends you something in French, it should appear to me in in, in English with French hidden down underneath. Yeah. And the same thing in Urdu and. We haven't had, I, I haven't had just millions of requests for it, to be honest. I mean, if I got a big pressure from the community that we needed that, then I would go and investigate it more thoroughly, but I haven't gotten it, so. Mark? A Google Translator is based on for using information theory models. Exactly. It's not using the standard handcrafted complexity exploding whatever. Yeah, it's, it, as, as I remember, it's entirely statistical uh, yeah. uh, parsing. My student used to work with Teller, O division of Livermore, got sick and tired of designing bombs and stuff. So he wanted to do a thesis on something completely different, blowing AI out of the water, and that was way back. And he did, as far as I'm concerned, but nobody paid any attention. <laughs> name? Anyone? His name. Mike Robert again. Okay. <laughs> so that's same twice, same. second time he's appeared in our uh, conversation today. <laughs> Looks same like we have to go and he dig up his same. dissertation and read it. That's the assignment for next week. He <laughs> uh, wrote, wrote the very complex program for Cray for man memory management. So all the secrets are in there. So you probably won't get that much out of the season. Except it takes about thirty thousand characters in English text to put the statistics to converge to get an idea of the complexity. Mm -hmm. There's a similar story on DNA, by the way, but I won't mention that. Another time. Okay, well, are there any other comments or questions here? Go ahead. I thought I mentioned Google Alerts, and I just was curious about that and discovered that they've gone commercial now. It was a beta product when it was at Google, and it's now Giga Alerts, and you pay an amount per month. Uh huh? Oh. Huh? <laughs> so it says here, Giga Alerts, formerly known as Google Alerts, and the cheapest version is five bucks a month for personal use. <laughs> That's interesting. Very interesting. Well, I've been running Google Alerts for years. They don't charge me a penny. Right. Hmm. I found all my old girlfriends that way. <laughs> As they appeared is on that the good news of the <laughs> It's still called yeah. Google Alerts and it's available at Google Alerts it at Google.com and it's free. Huh. It, it, it may be like a number of things that it's, uh, it, there's a, uh, a certain number that you can have for free, but if you want to have a lot of them, you have to pay. Or maybe somebody just figured out how to spam you with a right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. to pay for it. <laughs> Looked it up on Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, that's how you find all well, the Well, that's where they advertise. That's yeah. where Google <laughs> makes their money. <laughs> so, no spam, Karen? No, because your name's attached to everything you do, right? Inside. So. No an anonymity? No anonymity. But you can have a secret group. You can have a secret group, but. And the secret group can send messages to other people in groups? Only in their secret group, right? I mean, that's the idea of a secret group. We can't group? search it. Well, we can't. You, nobody else can search their content. Ah, okay. Not yet, apparently. Maybe time to. So, in other words, you need a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> a mole. <laughs> well, actually, actually, uh, as as time goes on, you're, that's that's an interesting question. When people leave the com company, what do they get to take with them? What do they? What happens? 
well, they, they, d they no longer have access to the system because um, it's based on their Active Directory credentials, which get turned off every, you know, on and off every day. Um, so if someone leaves, it's turned off, and so they can't get into the system then. Okay. And uh, because it's all work product done as, a, as, a, as an employee, it's owned by the company. Right, which, which is, the case, w is the case anyway, right? In r before this kind of platform, that was the case anyway. The, uh, the, only, the only thing is they're, they're, yeah. their access is blocked into the system. Um, their name will still appear in the system, but it'll say disabled or you know gone or whatever. But if they have created content, their name is still associated with it. So we always have the corporate memory of who actually created something. Okay. And you know there are uh, company-related information that's created by your users, mm -hmm. and there is personal information that's created by the users. And the copyright of the personal information is owned by the company. Or I mean, I, I just look at it as no different than email, right? I mean, it's, if it's your corporate email, it's just, this, is, this is the same thing. So if you're doing something personal on your corporate email, you kind of probably know that your company could see it if they wanted to, if they were choosing to dig around. And so it's the, sa it's the same thing. There are terms and conditions. You know, we have people check when they first sign in uh, for the first time, which basically say don't put up anything like, you know, credit card numbers or stupid things like that. But... No. no, I don't think so. I th I saw the iTunes one's like 64 pages or something. So yeah, you, you just go click, you know. <laughs> but, but the lawyers get really excited about writing them. You know, they made such a thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, remember that Microsoft when they had they had a a single standard password you could use everywhere, with a terms of service that gave them ownership of everything that passed through the system went through with the passport. I did not know that. Yes, it was mm. quite exciting. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, we had a 380 talk about uh, about that by a lawyer who was quite outraged by the whole system. Can you No. The, 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 the interesting question was, if you set a business plan, marked private confidential, uh, through a site where, which was protected under the, under the original pass, passport terms of service, uh, uh, who owned the uh, intellectual property? And it was an open question. It never got tested. Microsoft backed away from <coughs> the terms of service rather quickly. Well, you could do it like uh, in the old days. Leonardo da Vinci's drawings and everybody else's mechanical drawing always had errors in it. And those errors are basically unless you couldn't figure out what was wrong, they had to go to the person. It's the equivalent of patent. I see. Okay. So you can play the same games, <coughs> put enough uncertainty in it to get you get your way one way or another. Okay. I, I think I think this has been an interesting conversation, and it's uh, I think an interesting uh, an interesting way to explore ideas. There have been a few people who haven't said anything, and uh, if uh, if they have something to say, I think we'd like to hear that. And if they want to remain <coughs> silent, that's okay too. Uh, the vast majority of people are out in the uh, in the uh, uh, out on, in cyberspace uh, watching this after the fact, and so uh, they can't participate. Um, I think I think it's been an interesting experience. I want to thank you, Karen. It was very nice to thank have you come and talk. And uh, I think uh, at least I learned something. And so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>